Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is John Barton. I'm the director of Stanford's Architectural Design Program. Welcome to the last lecture in Stanford's 2023 Spring Lecture Series in Architecture, Landscape, and Urban Design. It has been really wonderful for us to all be back in community together for a whole season this year. The theme of this year's series is materiality. It's been inspiring to see how each of our speakers has interpreted that prompt. In fact, it has been a truly inspiring series of lectures by any measure. Before we begin, I want to thank the rest of our team who helped organize the series. Dave Lennox, the University Architect, Zach Posner, Director of Architecture in the University Architect's Office, Padma Kudiripudi, also from the University Architect's Office, and Jeff Tuttle sitting over there from the Architectural Design Program. I would also like to thank the American Institute of Architects Silicon Valley Chapter for their help in advertising the series and registering our program for continuing education ed continuing professional education. At the end of the lecture, your attendance will automatically be noted and submitted to the AIA. At the conclusion of the lecture, Jeff will take questions as time allows. Please speak boldly when you ask your question so that all can hear it. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Covell. After completing his BARC at Cornell University, Jeff signed on with the Portland-based firm Architropolis, doing fast-paced projects for retailers and rock stars, most notably a Miami residence for musician Len Lenny Kravitz. Three years after Jeff started, three years after that, Jeff started Skylab and has been leading a creative force in the dramatic evolution of Portland. Over the last 25 years, he has made his mark at both street level in the city's oldest neighborhoods and across the city's nascent skyline. Led by his experience and curiosity, Skylab brings extensive experience turning bold ideas into innovative places. The firm's award-winning work can be found in wildly different contexts. These range from remote hella skiing lodges to corporate campuses, urban infill projects to national retail rollouts, hotels, mixed-use commercial buildings to nonprofit and public projects. Skylab's innovation extends to their patented modular housing system called HOMB, um, Jeff's entrepreneurial spirit has established and developed a studio that has successfully developed and designed and managed the construction projects across the United States and in Canada. With Covell, there's always been a focus on a fresh approach, thinking smarter about materials, site, and the natural world to make iconic and lasting work. Led by his experience and curiosity, Skylab brings extensive experience, turning bold ideas into innovative buildings with an integrated understanding of regeneration, a strong narrative concept, and design strategy. Please give a warm Stanford welcome to Jeff Covell. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really exciting to be here. Uh, I such my first time on Stanford campus and we spent about five days, five hours with Zach, five <laughs> days, five hours with Zach walking around during all the buildings today and just uh, was so inspired by the collection of architecture here. It's really um, incredible. Um, anyway, so we're honored to be here and thank you, John. We also just finished a discussion with some students that was really fun and uh, just great to be here. Sorry, let me get my bearings here. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I worked a moment ago. Yeah. Do it manually. Sorry. No, it's working. Okay. That's all right. Great. Um yeah, so anyway, thanks for um thanks for having me. Um so this is an exciting uh presentation that we have to give tonight. Uh 
it's the first time I'm giving this specific presentation. We put quite a bit of work into um, uh, thinking through it, and um, it's it's essentially um, taking some of the work that we just did in our monograph, um, which has been published, and and figuring out how, how that might uh, be explored in this context. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about about me. Um, so. Uh, that's me on the on the right as a seven year old kid walking around my parents' uh, house as it was being constructed. Don't tell my Nike clients that I'm wearing an Adidas uh, <laughs> full, full uh, tracksuit there. Um, but I, you know, at seven years old, I fell in love with architecture and uh, construction, and I lived in this really cool house um, growing up in New York. And uh, just from an early age, just knew I wanted to be in design and and. Um, and went basically on the fastest path possible to to, to do that. Um, the house itself was, uh, you know, it was in some ways modest, but it was like actually a piece of architecture. It, it interpreted the landscape. It uh, it made occupying the site better, um, and it sent me on a journey that um, started with uh, high school Cornell architecture program. Um, ended up going there for for undergrad. Um, and after school, uh, moved to Portland from New York because I wanted to be near the mountains and um, be on the West Coast. And uh, the first job that I got was with a fellow um, named Michael Sizz, who uh, had Lenny Kravitz as his client. And so about six months after moving to Portland, I moved to Miami and I spent a year and a half building this house and music studio in a design build format. And I was, you know, I think I was 20 four years old or something like that, 23 years old. And, and I was running um, a construction company and doing design work on site. And we were like sweating through the sketches as we were making them. It was a hundred degrees and it was a really wild ride. Uh, and you know, I, I literally handmade like the fur line tunnel. Like I was the carpenter that made that, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but it was really, really fun experience. And when I got back from that, um, I, I couldn't really... Uh, I didn't feel good about continuing to work in that company. And I was looking at my options and I felt like, oh, you know, I'm 26. I don't know anybody in this town. I have no clients. Why not just start an architecture firm? Um, <laughs> and so I did that. And, you know, I, I built a set up an office and got the computers and, and the binders. And, uh, and, you know, just when I was starting to get really nervous, a client called and, um, we got a project in LA and sort of during that time, um, the, the house that the office was in, I kept driving by a, a site that had a for sale sign. And, uh, I could tell that the price was dropping. Nobody was buying the lot. And one day I climbed up there and I saw this beautiful view and said, you know, there must, you know, this, this is an incredible place to build a house. You know, what if we built a spec house as a way to kind of get, uh, Fast forward you know, to having a built ground up piece of architecture in my portfolio. And so I, I made like a really low offer on this land. Um, they, we, we got the land and I started looking at how to build a, a house on the site. And it turns out that like eight people had tried to design and build houses on this site, but everybody kept just trying to cut uh, like a 40 foot retaining wall into the hill. And there was like, you know, it cost like $300,000 at the time to, to shore up that hill. So I came up with this scheme to terrace a series of like 10 to 12 foot retaining walls up the hill and build this house and um, and essentially, you know, sold it and and it, and it kicked off uh, Skylab. Um, so today um, Skylab is about 30 folks, um, really diverse group of people, um, you know, a lot of different passions, architects, interior designers, planners, people with, uh, passion and, and product and brand and uh, landscape. Um, and, you know, I think that the consistent thing is, is you know, generally a very humble spirit and a very strong community, but, um, you know, a, a group that really likes to in innovate and take risks and, and kind of go down that journey. Um, so we have a really strong office culture um, that comes in, up in a lot of different ways. One of the ways is we have a, a band I play guitar in the band and Nita, my colleague that's here, sings and plays keyboards in the band. And uh, 
And we've actually played design events uh, throughout the Northwest. We're actually an international touring act because we, we played, <laughs> we played in, in Vancouver, BC at the, at the trade show. Um, but, you know, it's really fun to get together and collaborate in a way that's not just, you know, having meetings and making architecture, interior design, and it's a completely different set of, uh, of um, variables and, and skills. And I'm, I'm a, it's my first band, so I'm learning a lot um, in the process. <laughs> Um, but getting a little bit into um, talk, so this is our monograph. Uh, it's just published by Thames and Hudson, and uh, we we wanted to make a book for a long time. We kept feeling like we didn't have the body of work to do it, and um, and just at around the twenty year mark, we felt like we had the projects. And so the reason why this is spinning is that the book uh, project was inspired by. Um, Sort of the the classic double albums of of uh, of the musicians that really I think started in the sixties and seventies things like Pink Floyd, The Wall, or uh, Exile on Main Street. The thing that we love about these these bodies of work is that they it was it was taking a, a, a number of individual songs and putting them together in a, in a master concept. And the way it was packaged was a, a way that really helped uh, the artists communicate with their audience. And it wasn't just like pictures that you could see or music that you could just hear on the radio as a way to get to know the band better, to know what's behind the, the music. And, and it forced the band to be really thoughtful about how they put it together. And so we thought that was a really great metaphor for our monograph. We talk a lot about how our music is has parallels to, or our, I'm sorry, our architecture has parallels to music. Um, it's, it's very improvisational, but there's a, a very kind of strict cho choreography to it and a thoughtfulness about it. Um, and, um, and so we thought, what, what an interesting format to, to, to ex explore as a book. We, and it's really, you know, in a lot of ways risky, right? Because we, you know, we started this journey kind of like we started a design project. We didn't really know where it was going. So we went through a lot of different mock-ups trying to figure out how, how, do you make, um, how do you make an album out of an architecture uh, you know, career? <laughs> and um, and we, we, we came up upon this idea that the, the outside was going to be like a record sleeve and um simple and really sort of enhance the inside and, and inside you are going to see this sort of kaleidoscopic um, display of all the colorful environments and um, creative outlets that we've done in our work and you know kind of speaking to that material side of things like there's a really uh, significant exploration in our work of color yet there's also a, a, a awesome tonality of buildings that are often kind of very simple and monolithic and it's that playfulness of moving back and forth that we that we really enjoy. Um, the book also uh, explores uh, typography in in a way that we see as like a um, a metaphor to how we explore materials in our work. So we see materials as having like meaning and references. Maybe they reference an era. Maybe they you know reference like the way almost like semiotics that they they bring a, a connotation with them and we tend to employ materials in our work to tell a story. But we thought using the typeface in this way in the book and kind of getting out of the sort of strict, consistent uh, and really getting, showing the sort of playfulness um, was a way to help express our character to, to people that might be interested in learning about us. Um, we, we hired uh, an architecture critic from LA to write about us. She came up and spent three days with us and. You know, and wrote this really elegant um, uh, text about sort of the parallels of architecture and music, and sort of explored the themes that we said, and and took a really honest look at our work, and and had some really interesting um, uh, um, observations. Um, this this starts with this quote: "Refuse to play it safe, for it is from the wavering edge of risk that the sweetest honey of freedom drips and drips." That's um, from Tom Robbins, the author, at a graduation speech in 1974. We really love that quote because it's, you know, it, it really says that it's, you know, it's 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 worth it to put yourself out there and to take risks and to make yourself uncomfortable and to not do things the same way over and over again and to approach each project with fresh eyes and and not resort to sort of uh, preconceived outcomes. So, uh, the book format goes through kind of case study projects. Um, and then we have these things that we call interludes. So our work is really diverse. Like we're not, uh, we're working at massive uh, scale commercial projects and then small scale 
In this case, this is a bonsai um, tree exhibit at the Portland Art Museum. Um, and we were really struggling with how do we take all these diverse projects and kind of show them in the same format. Some projects, you know, you could have 25 pages on and some you just, you know, you can get the idea and, 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 you know, glimpse. And we thought it was really akin to sort of like how we're consuming media today, right? Which like you're, we're used to these sort of fast twitch um, uh, experiences. And so we, we embedded the series of posters in. And then we had a series of conversations and through those conversations, we really defined the themes that we think are the sort of secret sauce in Skylab's process. Um, and those themes are uh, regeneration, narrative, um, strategy, and speculation. And, and so I'm gonna talk kind of about each one of those and, and what they mean uh, in terms of our body of work. Um, so starting with regeneration, um, so, for me, regeneration is uh, collaborating with nature as an active partner in kind of each project that we design or, or approach. Um, and so that means on, in you know really urban conditions, looking at how we can reset that balance and even in very natural conditions, what's the appropriate balance? How do you sort of navigate the boundary, um, maybe try to dissolve the boundary between nature and, and architecture? Um, so there's a series of themes here. Um, we are naturalists uh, is, is a theme that, um, you know, it's a lens to kind of look through through architecture. And so this is a this is an interlude in a in a lecture format, which is a bit of an experiment. But um, this is the Weave building, which is a, a speculative building that we um, put together in 2007 on a small 5,000 foot site in Portland. And um, the thing about this building, it actually didn't get built because of um, the 2008 recession, but it had this really innovative green roof. And that green roof became a seed uh, that, that uh, fertilized a lot of our subsequent work. Um, it was also um, the first green roof that the city of Portland um, accepted as both a, a water, um, treating facility in addition to just a, a, a slowing down um, and containing the, the water to sort of take some pressure off the city's sewer system and, and rain events. So that started to get us some recognition. Uh, we ended up pursuing a RFP for a, a city project uh, shortly thereafter called the Columbia Building. Um, this building is actually the city of Portland's wastewater treatment plant. Um, which up until our engagement was really just a, a, a utilitarian um, site filled with kind of tanks and filters and screens. And uh, it was really quite interesting, but the, um, the city had proposed, there, there was this historic access that ran kind of right up through the center of campus. And that was the only way in and out. And you had to tee off here and Industrial traffic was was using that civilian traffic, school groups. It was really the only way in and out. And then there had grown up a sort of uh, grouping of uh, trees that had grown to full scale in the middle of the site, and that's where they wanted to build the building. And so we had never done a public building. I think at this point we we had never really done a ground up commercial building at all. Um, and we proposed this idea to sort of slide the building over create a uh, commons that would connect some of the buildings that had people working in them and, and save the trees, essentially. Um, and, and we won the, the project award. Um, and so uh, we started our process, which always starts with what we call kind of building the DNA of a project. It's a, sort of a, a right brain and left brain research process where we try to learn as much as we can about like the ecological history of a site or the anthropology logical history of the site or just the history of uh, you know construction and the techniques they used here or the cultural history um, and then also the you know technical things like the zoning or in this case like the native species that that used to live on site that could be restored um, and we took that into um, kind of just starting to ask questions and for us asking questions is like the key to to coming up with different solutions than, than you might think. And we couldn't figure out like what this plant was actually doing. There was just tanks and pi pipes everywhere. And, and we really wanted to understand like, how did this work? And so we started building these diagrams about how the, the 
uh, liquids and solids were separated and where the influent lines were. And, you know, our client was kind of like, huh, no, you know, nobody that we've worked with has ever really tried to, to figure this out. Why are you doing it? It's like, well, we want to be able to tell the story of what's happening here to, to visitors. And one of the main things we wanted to try to figure out was just how much water was running through this place in a day, because it just kind of comes in underground and it goes back out to the Columbia River and it's sort of a big mystery. And so we came up with this scheme uh, as it was similar to our RFP proposal, but slightly different, where we took the, the building and we, we curved it. So it's a, it's a segmented or a radius building. We actually brought it across that historic entrance and made it the gateway to the site. Uh, bermed the building, uh, put Clara stories in the building, put a green roof on one side with the native uh, restoration scheme, and then kind of protected this European uh, landscape in the center. Um, and when we did that, uh, we inscribed this sort of perfect circle on the site. Um, and that that circle um, was something like 100,000 gallons of water, one foot thick, um, when we did we did the math. And so we use that as a way so that you can walk out into the garden and you can see the circle that you could imagine you know, how high the column of water would be in, in, in the um, winter or in the summertime, depending on the flows. And, and this became like an information graphic in the, in the um, entrance to this building. Um, the plan itself uh, has a, a berm, as I said, which the stormwater flows the, off the roof um, down these visual runnels and, and out to this retention pond. But it gave us the ability to sort of put the solid program spaces like storage, bathrooms, uh, conference rooms, kind of along that berm, there's a rail line that runs through here. So it's, it was a great way to sort of mitigate, um, oops, that's in there twice, uh, a great way to mitigate the, um, the noise from the train and kind of protect uh, the occupants of the building. This building's for construction engineers um, and for construction supervisors, or, or I'm sorry, plant engineers and construction supervisors. Um, and so it's an office building, it's a, a, a reception building, it's the education kind of uh, place where you, you start your tours. Um, and one of the things is there's a, a residential neighborhood across the street, and this plant had always been behind a barbed wire fence with a gate. And we said, well, you know, how can we get rid of that? Um, and so the idea is that the building became the security itself, so we could remove the fence and kind of invite the public in. And then this berm became this uh, restorative meadow um, where the um, stormwater could be seen kind of dripping off the roof. Um, and inside, uh, continue to tell that story. We really we wanted to build a building that was built like they were building the plant. So concrete, tanks, and glaze block. Here we uh, inkjet printed a, a map of the region's watershed onto the block. Um, the folds in the roof let in light. Um, and then the offices themselves have this great glazed wall with uh, natural ventilation that faces the, the commons. Um, we're really into narrative and, and storytelling. And so we wanted to tell the story of like, the history of um, stormwater management in Portland here. So we found a lot of ways to do that uh, through the site, whether it was murals or uh, timelines. Um, we also were want to tell a story about species um, that that uh, were endangered here. So all the signage around uh, has these like hand illustrated uh, uh, animals uh, and the story about that that species on them. And then lastly, uh, there was a big project in Portland to build a, a pipe underground that was six miles long. That was basically like a giant storage tank. So that as it rained, the water would fill that pipe and instead of overflowing into the river, they could then kind of slowly pump the water back to the plant at a, at a pace that they could manage. Um, but once that pipe was built, nobody could ever see it again. And so we proposed this idea of salvaging pieces of it and bringing it onto the site and making it into the sort of um, space that you could occupy. So it could tell a story of that kind of uh, uh, permanently. So with that, uh, we also work in a lot of urban environments. Um, this building is uh, was our offices. And after that spec home, um, we ended up taking the proceeds and buying this building that we were renting space in. And, um, 
and uh, I actually ended up living here for about 15 years. Um, and that space you see on the top, that sliver, was a, about sort of uh, marking a view that didn't exist before, which was really acknowledging the church spire across the street and sort of creating that sort of epiphany moment um, that that was there, but you know, architecture needed to reveal. Um, from there, we we started working on bigger projects, um, kind of continuing some of these themes. Um, this is a 350,000 square foot um, high rise that we did in uh, on the east side of Portland. And this was actually our second commercial ground up building. So the first one was the Columbia building, which was like 13,000 feet. And then we went to 350,000 feet. Um, and, and then actually tripled that for one of the next ones. But um, this project is a really intriguing project. The city, um, had this four block site and they had a like one developer opus that was going to do a sort of mega development on it. And it had like a Lowe's home improvement store and it was, it was kind of horrible. Um, and it yeah. fell apart in one of the, the recessions and they didn't know what to do with the land. So they, they hired Will Bruder architects. They came in and did a framework plan and they looked back and said, why don't we chop this site back up into small pieces like the, to the um, Sanborn fire maps and and put it back out there and try to get multiple developers here going and um, and um, and get you know build a neighborhood that actually has different points of view and the eclectic mix of architecture and um, so we uh, we had proposed we were working on this small building on the other side of the bridge and we needed more parking so we said well, we'll put in our, our our hat in the ring to get a small piece of land for some parking and the city said well we don't really want parking. And we'd rather you look at the whole block instead of, you know, the eighth block. You could tell this, this site, this is the main intersection in Portland, north-south, Burnside Bridge. You can see the city views, incredible sunset views of the city over the river, and this sort of like gritty industrial cultural quality um, that was kind of most probably, most internationally known for the Burnside Bridge skate park, which is underneath um, the bridge right next to our site. And we started sort of collecting some of this imagery and thinking about, you know, how do we how do we bring a how do we build build a full block high rise in a, a side of the city that's never had one, um, and it was a recession or coming out of the tail of a recession, and so we knew we had to build this really affordably, um, and you know, and it needed to be successful in drawing people into a place that was really just industry and parking and. Um, refrigerated trucks and things like that. And so we decided that our solution was going to be to take a parking lot and um, and turn it into a park. And that that was kind of our North Star. Uh, and so we took the park and we lifted it up and uh, put the parking garage under it, which brought the uh, park up to bridge height so that this green roof park was now kind of visible for the whole city. Um, you know, not a sort of gated community roof kind of deck terrace, but really literally open to the public. Um, and then we lifted up the tower on top of that and we explored a lot of orientations on the tower, but ultimately landed on this diagonal um, orientation. And um, th there was a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, one of the things, cause we were such a young firm and we hadn't done this before, you know, we felt like we really needed to prove that this design could uh, could deliver better results than a sort of baseline project. So we we actually designed uh, three towers in addition to this. One that was a north-south aligned bar, one that was a um, east-west aligned bar, and one that was an L-shaped bar. And because those are all the conventional solutions. I mean, so we've designed those to understand what those performos and unit counts can look like. And then said, well, no, you know, all those have pros and cons to them, you know, what would be a better approach? And so we said, well, if we, if we, if we put the building on the diagonal, it actually um, squares up the view to downtown and it opens up this side of the building for more natural light um, and mountain views. And it helps mitigate like the harsh summertime um, sunsets, which are actually coming from here. Um, and in addition to that, um, as we as we got into the project further, we learned that the big pipe that that relic that we saved over at the Columbia building ran under this site. And so you couldn't put any deep foundations over that. So it was a very tricky uh, 
a problem to solve, how to build a high rise over this pipe. Um, and so by, by, by making the tower a diagonal, we were able to basically align the, the deeper foundations with the same angle. The other problem we had is that we were building kind of right here, and this is this is what's happening underground. And you can see there's sort of like a cliff in the underground soil conditions because this is the Willamette River, and all of the good uh, bearing conditions basically disappeared as we kind of got to about this point in our building. So you can see the point on this. These are all diagonal um, pilings that uh, um, are essentially uh, cantilevering the building out over this um, from the bedrock over the gravel. So it's quite a, a, an integrated solution for a lot of different reasons, you know, including kind of the sales pitch to the folks that would be renting units um, in terms of mountain views or um, city views. Uh, and this is the finished kind of um, aerial. And it's really an extraordinary um, solution, like any other multifamily building that, that I know of. Um, and it created this incredible uh, green roof, um, which we see as like uh, almost a restoration of the historic meadow that was probably on this riverbank um, before um, this turn from farm, well, from natural land to farmland or industrial land. And so we see it as 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 that sort of um, sort of artistic reference. And then we wanted to. Uh, Manitize this building in an unusual way. Um, and so we were looking kind of at hotel projects, thinking, well, how can we do, make a apartment building that's more like a hotel? And we just had this great space on the corner, and we decided, like, well, what if we did a, a hot springs inspired soaking club? Um, that would be a social club where you could hot, you know, cold plunge, hot plunge, warm bath, sauna steam plus yoga studios, fitness, uh, et cetera, and really make this instead of just like a, a 1,500 square foot gym in the building, which is what all the competitors were doing in their building. Yeah, how can we make this basically a standalone business? So this this is called Knot Springs, which is a play on on uh, fake hot springs. Uh, it's K N O T, not like a tree, uh, and it lives in the most prominent place in this building. It has 700 members, um, and now um, we're doing uh, Seattle version, a second Portland, and we're looking in other cities right now. Uh, it's really a quite successful one. Um, around this roof podium, you can see how sort of nature, you know, for us, it's like, like we, we, we love these moments when sort of there's as much nature as there is architecture and like really finding that balance you know, is, is a priority to us. And this, this is a great example. It's a co-working space on the, on the roof of the building where you get that, that feeling. Um, the building sits in a really prominent space culturally in the city. Um, uh, this is the George Floyd protest in 2020. You can see the building in the background. Um, parades run down this. That that deck becomes sort of like uh, an amphitheater kind of for watching the you know the fireworks for Fourth of July, and et cetera. And and then on the right, I, I really love this image where you see the the, the sort of the modern uh, tower as it kind of uh, infuses itself into this industrial um, neighborhood and brings people um, into a place where where they need, we need more of them. Uh, so during that project, uh, we felt we were worried because there was not a lot of development around here at the time. And we, we felt like this was, we were building in all these retail ideas and concepts. And we felt like, you know, we wanted to make sure these retailers could survive um, and that they, there wasn't sort of, they weren't on an island and in a way like so dislocated where we would just have a rotating, you know, uh, vacancy problem. And so, we came up with this idea to take that green roof and sort of land it across the street. And um, this was sort of uncommissioned work where we were just playing and uh, both to kind of um, get the development team excited about it, but also the city. And we convinced the city through these images that they should actually not give this little parcel of land to who they gave it to and that they should sell it to, to our group. And, and so we got the piece of land and as we started um, getting into designing that building, we very quickly realized that that scheme just it didn't have enough square footage to make something pencil. It was like it was like a museum kind of idea or something like that. It, it, it wasn't a, a economically viable footprint. And so we started looking at, well, how do we make an economically viable building here? And, you know, acknowledging that it's this fragment of land, there's bridge abutments and all this weird subterranean stuff running through here. And 
so we came up with this idea to do sort of a skinny tower. Um, we would make it out of uh, cross laminated timber, um, which is uh, a wood technology where essentially the whole building was a kit that was computer lathe and cut off site and brought in and assembled. Um, it also used um, panelized skin. Uh, so essentially, we, we because there was no lay down area, because it was such a small footprint, we had to figure out how to build the smarter to get it to, to pencil. Um, and the, the result is really, really beautiful because the whole interior of the building is, is this exposed wood structure. Um, and that you can see like a lot of the buildings around here, including our first building on the left, they were sort of cheap, you know, like they were all using metal, painted metal skin or stucco, or like there was no, there was no history of like rents and underwriting in this neighborhood to sort of uh, to justify spending too much. Like I, I think the tower we built for $260 a foot, um, which is kind of amazing looking back on it now, especially how things have changed. But when we got around to building this building, we felt like, we could build something that had a, a stronger kind of sense of permanence and stature. And so we went to this sort of brick idea and thought that that, that brick skin would really highlight the wood, um, especially with the lights on at night um, inside. And you know, one of the amazing things, at least for me, is like, this is actually, like, this is like the coolest thing as an architect, when you're actually standing in one of your buildings, looking at one of your <laughs> other buildings. <laughs> I never, I never thought that that would happen, or even you know that, that was a thing. But it's a really incredible corner to stand. You can see the green roof, and you can see the views out to the city, and um, you really get the sense of like the how this uh, this kind of urban laboratory has changed with these ideas um, that we planted. Uh, so the next section in here is about strategy, um, and the. For us, strategy is kind of like um, just building smarter. So how, how can we do things in a, in a more intelligent way? Um, you know, in order to keep keep uh, more design in the project, less value engineering. Um, so we came up with this idea for a, a modular system of construction. Um, it's uh, built out of 100 square foot modules, and you can assemble them kind of any way you want. This is the first building we built out of them, and the idea is that you could reverse engineer a building um, from its budget and say, okay, you have X amount of money, you can afford 10 modules, like kids building blocks, you could build anything you want out of that and get sort of, you know, close to, to being uh, on, on target. Um, and so this uh, system has now gone on, we're, we're building actually houses in all over the place, but that now it's been kind of a slow process, but it's, it's really, it's really taken root. But we've been, also had the ability to take that same system and apply it to um, commercial spaces. So this is a building called the Sky Lodge. Uh, this is uh, in Eden, Utah. It's a Powder Mountain is the ski area. This is kind of on top of the ski area. A group of entrepreneurs bought this um, mountain and they wanted, they're like millennials. And they had no patience and they wanted to get something immediately. And so they asked us how fast we could get a building on site. And so I think this was like in August or something. And so we designed and fabricated and, and installed the building in I think six months and in January we set the building. But it was really inspired by these sort of like temporary encampments. We wanted to have that, that vibe to it. So instead of just doing trucks and modules, we also wanted to do um, some yurts. And I, I've always been interested in yurts, but I've always been really frustrated that yurts don't have any windows, essentially. They're, they're like completely disconnected from the outside, generally. Um, and so we, our idea was to, to rethink that and build a modular yurt um, that would complement these um, factory built modules. So this is the, the factory built modules being set in January, like in ice rhyme. Uh, it was really wild, uh, but successful. Um, and then right after we installed these post and beam um, yurts, which are essentially like a wood truss that's, um, you know, hexagonal or something like that. Like it, it has a, um, a segmented um, uh, architecture. And by doing that, we were able to install you know, basically the same, only three types of windows, you know, in, in multiples. And so we were able to order all the windows as a kit, assemble it really quickly, 
It has no column, which is kind of unusual, and especially in, in a 270 pound per foot snow load. And then we put a um, like a traditional yurt roof on top. We actually, it's the only part of the yurt we bought was the was the roofing um, and the skylight because uh, we wanted to have that vibe. Um, inside, it's all um, vinegar treated wood. So it's got the sort of aged, beautiful patina. Um, and then you can see how the yurts sort of complement. It's really quite quite a strange building, but it's really been effective. It's it's people from all over the world have been in this building and and. This group is a really influential group, and and this is basically their hospitality center. And um, the idea now we're looking at is actually continue to build modularly and expand the encampment and uh, build cabins in the hotel. So, kind of continuing with that, um, there's a project which is a, a an interlude here, which uh, was a, a a diner renovation um, for into a music venue and um, restaurant and bar. And we wanted to, this is an old motel, and this is a business that, that I owned and operated for 15 years with, with two partners. Um, but we wanted to kind of go back to the, harken back to the days when the motel was this sort of kitschy experience where you got to learn like, like you know, the most iconic element of a place would turn into its interior design. So we wanted to do that here. So we, we came up with this idea to take log and mash up this sort of log cabin with, um, the 60s diner and uh we prefabricated this whole set of logs like, like at this point i think skylab was two or three people so i hand drew all this numbered each log and ordered all this stuff and we ended up um, installing this kit of parts uh, i think it was something like five thousand <laughs> linear feet of logs in in a pretty interesting modular way um adaptive reuse is something that we've, we've done a lot of, and I think that's part of that is just by this nature of starting a firm without clients in a city that doesn't have you know huge economic drivers. We just you had to do a lot with whatever you could get your hands on. And this project is a really fascinating project. Um, this is Sandy Bodecker. He's he's now passed away, but he is a really creative uh, guy. Uh, one of the sort of five or six most creative in the history of Nike, and um, he came to us and said, "I want to." I want to create a creative compound. Um, he said he didn't know where to be, maybe in Central Oregon, maybe in Hawaii. Um, can I? Would, would we help him bring this idea to life? He doesn't know what the program should be. He doesn't know exactly what should be. He has a lot of ideas. Can he help us sift through it? And uh, just like two days before, somebody sent me a flyer on these warehouses in Portland, and these are there was an old ch chocolate factory with this really cool textured facade, and and these were destined to be torn down. And um, I, I I showed them to him. I was like, these are really cool. I think I you know we probably should do the project in Hawaii though. Um, <laughs> and and he and he actually literally the next day bought bought these warehouses, and we we started trying to figure out what to do with them and looking at a lot of different creative programs, Sandy was really interested in mashing up, um, you know, music and skating and uh, printmaking and um, kind of putting them all in the same place. And so what we thought was, well, what if um, instead of building this in an exotic environment, what if we bring the exotic environments here? So all of these spaces are um, these outliers. So this is a beach, this is a beach environment with a, a, a beach campfire. And then there's a bamboo garden back in here with um, mini golf. There's a skate bowl here. And then there's a sort of basketball slash event gallery here. And then in the middle is the sort of the, the program and the new construction building that we created. Um, and so we took and we actually turned some of these warehouses into like ruins. And um, this, this was originally called Sinbin, which has a lot of different meanings. I guess it's where you put people in penalty box in some sports, which uh, Sandy was interested in. It's also what people call um, the garbage can when you crumple up failed sketches and throw them into the uh, garbage can. So we had this idea, well, what if the building kind of had that expression to it? And so we came up with this really uh, geometric sort of sculptural, almost rotational building that um, sat amongst these different garden spaces. And as you move through the building, you could inhabit all the roofs and ultimately it got you to a campground on the roof, um, that's a tent. And then you could come up here and look out at the city and this is actually a slide 
Um, and it was really this like iconic sort of playground um, of creativity. Um, so when Sandy passed away, uh, it turned into a, a foundation and now um, students from all over can apply and come here um, and, and be creative um, and be, cre oh, sorry, be creative with their, with their peers. Um, throughout the projects, the Sandy's father was an artist and illustrator and children's book author and a big inspiration to him. So we, we really explored his art and his illustrations and, and made wallpaper out of them and textiles out of them. It's a little bit hard to see here, but there's a, a booth in here, which is completely uh, upholstered in his art. Um, and then upstairs, there's two artists in residences um, and these kind of contemplative spaces. And the idea is that people could come here and, and shack up for as long as they wanted and uh, skate, uh, make music in the music studio, et cetera. Um, and the finished product, um, you can still see those two old warehouses and then these, uh, these new buildings kind of as, the, as they weave themselves in. Um, so the last section here, narrative. Um, so in some ways, this is the first section in the way we think about work. Um, but it's, it's the idea of like, really, how do you make unique outcomes in projects and tell deep stories and make more resilient buildings, buildings that last longer, buildings that people would keep wanting to come back to, or businesses that people would keep wanting to come back to. We think that's through storytelling. Um, and uh, I know that's like a buzzy thing to say, but we were doing this 25 years ago. It's been our process, you know, all the way. Um, and, and it's that, you know, I, I think about the spaces we make as almost as if they're, they're people and they have a character to them. Um, and we're trying to sort of assemble that character with each, um, with each project. So, uh, the first one here is, uh, is a manifestation of two families in the mountains in Colorado. This is Snowmass, um, and it's in a really prominent site in between Aspen and Snowmass. It's a triangular site, the kind of postage stamp of a, of a buildable area. Um, and we came up with this idea for a symmetrical building using a prefabricated steel frame. And, and then basically each, each family, brother and sister, each have essentially a wing. They're equal, like literally, so they can't fight about whose side is whose side. <laughs> and they can have their kind of spirit artifacts and their, their personal artifacts, and it comes together and creates this place for, for them to, to raise their, their children. And, uh, mountains are a big passion of mine. Um, a lot of our work is in mountain environments. Um, recently, we completed... Um, our, our largest sort of mountain project to date, which is at the Schweitzer ski area in Idaho. Um, and this project was also really interesting because when we, when we got engaged in this project, it also didn't really have a program. We were brought in to help kind of fix the ski resort because it had been built over time in a really haphazard way with no design review and no real like urban design uh, or planning. And, and so we, but that, this is the largest, one of two privately held um, ski area. So they own something like 5,000 acres of like technically de developable land. Um, and they wanted to help kind of unlock the value of that. And so we came in and we started looking at the history of the resort, of the place. They had this great vintage branding. Schweitzer is a name that's named after this legend about the Swiss man that lived in a cave on the mountain. Uh, there's a, a rich local history. Um, uh, uh, industry, lumber. Um, and so we sort of looking at all this stuff and uh, at the same time kind of studying their resort plan, trying to figure out how do you fix this thing. Um, you know, most people, when they think of alpine environments that they like, they think about small streets with no cars and pedestrian scale. And you can tell like, like none of that is happening here, right? <laughs> Um, and so what we proposed was to build a building that kind of inserted itself in, uh, put a new drop off in face on the resort and kind of started the, developing a pattern of more intimate spaces. And, and then we proposed that as development continued that we could essentially start to consume the surface parking because this is a really sloped area. And so anything level is super valuable. And why are we putting cars there? So we we propose, you know, essentially 
moving the cars and putting in a, a, a funicular and, and um, anyway, so out of this master plan process, they, they decided that they agreed and the first thing we should build is a hotel. And while we were building that hotel, we should solve a bunch of their, their issues. So uh, the hotel sits on an underground parking lot that actually connects three buildings um, and, and moves the entrance of the cars and the path of the cars out of the area of, of pedestrians. Uh, it puts a new uh, face on the uh, resort with a new drop-off area where you can actually like come up with your family and um, and unload in a, in a nice way. And it's still a long distance to the lift. So just trying to make that the best experience possible. And then, you know, it puts an iconic new building at the face of this resort. So to really announce that things are different here now, and we're going in a different direction. And um, one of the things about this resort is it has an incredible view down to the lake. So um, there's a kind of a grid shift that happens in this building where um, we take the structural grid and uh, we decided to do a single loaded corridor so that every room had a, a view of the lake and that the geometry of the building set up for that sort of prime viewing angle. Um, also, uh, we added the second building, which was uh, to help mask the sort of armpit of this uh, building that had been built they, that they thought that they were going to extend but never did. And we decided that a spa and a ski locker uh, grouping over there would work really well with um, a restaurant and bar here, guest services on the lower floor, and then a, um, a, a glass room out at the end that would be a, a lounge for the, the residents and really that kind of iconic feature as you enter. So this is the completed project. You can see that glass room um, at the end. That's actually the spa here on top. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really... Uh, significant shift in architectural styles for this area. Um, they actually asked us to go back and we picked kind of new paint schemes for their existing buildings um, and kind of try to help weave these things together. Um, but in this case, we also looked at um, cross laminated timber for just the public spaces. So the spaces where we wanted to vault and make uh, more complex, um, like the, the restaurant bar, and the lobby, uh, guest services lobby, uh, we brought in post and beam. And here you can see the cross laminated timber panels being sit, set. Um, and, and then, you know, again, we have in that narrative. So this is a, a story about the Humbert mine and the histor historic elements throughout and um, branded elements like the Swiss patterning. And ultimately that this sort of glass room is this lounge and game room for the guests where you can really connect with the lake in a way that just, it was always there, but you could never occupy this place before. And that's one of the things that I love personally about architecture is being able to create things like this out of, of thin air. Um, and this is the sort of facade as you approach and each floor has a different wallpaper that we designed and, and each one is sort of meant to, like one is a summertime lake uh, print one's a forest view. They're, they're all meant to sort of elicit um, uh, ways for people to connect with the place, hopefully over, over alternate seasons. So um, narrative is also really good for brands and it really helps brands, you know, tell their story, their consumers. This is a wallpaper company and we designed their headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. And the idea of this project was essentially to take their patterns and three-dimensionalize them and build spaces out of them that were like really kind of holistic um, and and help show clients that wallpaper can be used in three-dimensional ways. Um, and one of the insights in this project that was really interesting is for about four months of our schematic design process, we had the showroom on the retail level and the manufacturing on the second level. And we, we realized one day that that was the wrong approach and that if we move the manufacturing down to street level that this place would become like theater at street level and it would really it would it would help build the band, build the brand in a much more powerful way um, because of of that kind of uh, event that we created in the city and and it worked um, that people are literally lined up watching these guys print outside all day um, so I think this is the last project in here. This is this is our our biggest accomplishment to date. This is a building that we started in 2014, and it delivered in the pandemic, which was odd. <laughs> I was like 
working on the most important thing your whole life and then having it like like launched in the empty room um, <laughs> but uh but now it's full of people and we were talking about today i was saying that we we're actually going to do a, a new photo shoot there because like we can actually have people in, in the photographs <laughs> and, um but so this this project um this a million square feet which is like the size of levi's stadium it's it's really massive it's four city blocks long by three city blocks wide and it's the design studios for all of the brands all the categories of design and at nike um and uh it, it, nike campus was designed kind of in three phases there's original campus here which is they actually built to be so generic so that if the company failed they could sell it to some other company and then the second phase, they felt like they were had more momentum and they could make it more interesting. And these are all white buildings, all by the same architect. And then the third phase, um, they hired a grouping of architects, uh, uh, Olson Kundig, Skylab, ZGF architects, SRG architects. And we all kind of came together and, and uh, created a, a, a new side of campus that has a much more aggressive, much more interesting uh, architectural style. Um, so the thing that was amazing about this project for us is not only the sheer size um, and just the challenge of that. We were like 28 person firm at the time. And I think at one point we had 28 people working on this. It was, it was, you know, a really wild ride. Um, but we had this incredible um, athlete that was the namesake of the building and Serena Williams. Um, and the idea, most buildings at Nike had been named after they'd been designed. We got we knew that this before we started design. And so for us, the narrative piece, um, sorry, those was, you know, this was an incredible leg into starting that process. So uh, people at Nike had come up with this idea of her as a warrior muse and this idea that she has got this really soft uh, personal side, but then this just the most fierce competitive side that you that have anybody alive. Um, and, and we love that. And, you know, we felt like that was obviously gonna be a really important piece of the narrative, also, this building was negotiated at the only high rise ever in this county. So it, and this was through a deal that Nike made um, you know, with, the, with the government and the tower was gonna live on our site. So we, we knew that this was gonna be the iconic kind of moment on campus, like the clock tower of campus essentially. Um, and so we knew that this had to have really strong kind of brand history and narrative to it. And it was really those two things that, that we, we started to bring together. Um, we went to work, we started working on schemes. I think we had like 13 schemes. We narrowed it to these three. We presented it to um, to Mark Parker, the CEO at the time. This one was inspired by um, starting blocks. Uh, this one was just inspired by the idea of creating like an arena form. Um, and then the one in the middle was the selected scheme was inspired by the wing on the Nike goddess, the, the namesake of the brand, um, but also like a really, a really rich, metaphor um you know th that that essentially came down to these three elements for us one was this idea that um the wing represented like like uh almost the, the players in a team coming together in a unified way it, or in this case like the categories of a business um also the idea uh, of the watershed and that street you know creeks and streams come together the great rivers and and lakes and oceans and that sort of um, concept. Um, and then the, just the heritage back to the brand and the naming. So um, the scheme that was selected uh, um, was a really exciting one to build. Um, the, the program, you can see here how um, the different phases of, of campus come together. This is Ronaldo Fields, which is the center of soccer fields. This is the, the building formerly known as Lance Armstrong. This is uh, this is Tiger Woods, and then our tire our towers here, and so you can see it's all very formally set up. But one of the things that's amazing about campus, there's this incredible creek and wetlands here, and all of the phases of uh, development before our building had just completely turned their backs onto this wetland. Like it was looked as a, as like a negative or something bad. It wasn't like ecology wasn't seen as a driver of campus and. And we saw it as the most exciting and promising part of, of the project. And um, one of the things is the loading dock for Tiger Woods had to kind of come through here, right, right uh, on our sort of uh, waterfront. Um, which I'll, so what we did, and this is this is the expanded um, the diagram of the floor plates of this building. 
there's underground parking and then we did an underground loading dock um which the road to the tiger woods loading dock goes through which is really cool because it means that this building literally has no backside because all of the, the backside is underground so it has 360 degrees of, of uh facade that face um, people and nature and, and whatnot. Then there's a merchandising center, which is essentially, it's a 300,000 square foot shopping center that's never gonna be open to the public. It's just to test retail environments. And the idea is that you can start designing a product up here, bring it through all the stages of design through the building and then um, launch it in its final retail environment. And then you have the partners and whatnot, and then, um, and then put it out in the world. So really kind of controlling that whole process in one location. These are all office bars. And then the tower has a rooftop restaurant, a banquet hall, uh, an auditorium, lecture hall, um, some, some conference spaces and whatnot. And so from, from that combination of kind of Warrior Muse and Nike brand heritage and the idea that this sort of like merchandising center was like the basically the intellectual property was being it's like a vault of intellectual property for this company. We started looking at the, the palace in Tokyo and thinking about how interesting it was that it sort of sat on this crenellated sort of stone base, which was, you know, a protected piece. And, and then the lightness and sort of cantilevered roof lines. And uh, we saw those as this sort of metaphor to, to samurai warrior and, um, or sorry, samurai war, warrior armor. And, um, and we took a lot of these themes into the skin of the building. Um, and this is a view kind of as the approach of the building where you see the wings of the building kind of coming together around the tower um, and really kind of highlighting that moment of, um, of the, the different branches of the uh, company coming together. And the tower itself, um, we went through a series of exercises on and struck on this idea that we were gonna do the split tower that would have kind of two different uh, qualities to it. And one would be Bill Bowerman and one would be Phil Knight, the two founders of, of Nike. And they'd each have, you know, one was sort of stoic and a little bit more conservative and uh, sat upright. And one was flashy and leaning forward and blazed. And, and they, they would merge kind of handshake and plan. And that would represent this idea that, that the company of Nike, which is literally true, was built on a handshake. They didn't have a contract when they formed the company. And, and that's a, a, a really significant piece of information. So we, we actually put in a um, cornerstone on the tower, which actually lives right here and inscribed built on a handshake on it um, to, to reflect that. Um, uh, so the sustainability, this is a lead platinum building, um, which you know, is incredibly hard to do at the scale. Um, the, idea in diagram is that the stormwater would be sort of captured on the roofs, come down and ultimately connect with the wetlands. And, um, and by doing that, we would also sort of terrace uh, the, the site so that, or the, the scale of the building. So it would never overwhelm kind of the, the um, scale of the rest of campus. And here you can see how that kind of comes together. And this, this is actually covering the loading dock. And we have this terrace here running trail, wetlands, bridge, and how sort of this, now this is the cafeteria of the building, uh, which now faces the wetlands and, and, and really kind of turns this, this whole thing around. Um, for us, one of the things that's really exciting is, is the sort of spaces in between spaces. So the negative space in this project, um, the absence of a building was a really big opportunity. Um, we again looked at trying to create a lot of discrete gardens um, and outdoor spaces and seeing them as sort of regenerative places for the harsh cycles of the designers in this building. Um, they say there's no finish line at Nike and there's definitely no finish line in their design teams. They're just going from season to season to season, deadline to deadline. And we wanted to give them access to nature as a way to, 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 re, um, to rehab, um, refresh. Um, and so this is actually, this garden, is up on the roof of the merchandising center and it's inspired by a Pacific Northwest rainforest. We brought in trees and stumps and um, uh, wanted to create sort of nurse logs and uh, plantings that would be um, native to the area and built these elevated walkways and it's groupings of seedings. And actually I was just back here last week and now it's grown in more and I'm really excited to, to shoot it again because it's, it's a really incredible space. Uh, and, and then there was the main plaza. This is called Serena's Garden. 
Um, and this was um, filled with her favorite like white roses. And this is more of like the gathering place. They When she came and, and, um, and uh, for the building opening, there was about 5,000 people in the space. It was, it was incredible. Um, and here you see like the, the, the most iconic part of this building is these bridges that, that connect the wings. They all live on the design floor of the building. Really the only must have from the CEO was that he wanted us to design the building in a way so all the designers could be on the same floor across all of the the, um, the building units so or the business units so um, that they could cross pollinate design and they could they could see what the other teams were doing and try to have that sort of institutional memory um, embedded in the way the building was arranged um, and that designer space culminates on one of the one of the my favorite roof decks, um, which is a, a private terrace for, for the designers. You can see Mount Hood kind of in the distance back here. Um, the other thing about this building is, well, there's a whole culture in Nike by using the stairs and discouraging elevators. So this building is so big, it has, it has something like 17 fire stairwells in it. And then in addition to that, I think we have like 35 interconnecting stairs. And in order to have the designers on single floor, we needed to have like marketing and sales and their support groups, you know, accessible easily from each sort of pot of space. And so there's these interconnecting stairs throughout um, that, that help accomplish that. And then also just this idea that you're getting activity by using the stairs instead of the elevators. Um, uh, and, and throughout, I mean, one, one of the things about this building is the scale so big, it's sort of like a city. So we, we had uh, a cadence and pattern of uh, kitchens and conference rooms and uh, neighborhood restrooms. And then like these amenity spaces like uh, atriums punctuating and maker spaces. And um, the other thing is that it's so big that you can get lost. So we, we gave each bar a color um, theme. And through these sort of acoustic panels, uh, which go up to the light wells and the carpets, which actually ombre fade from uh, darker tones to lighter tones, you can help identify through like a intuitive wayfinding and graphics what area of the building you're in. There's also sort of these artful moments throughout. Um, this is a, a, a fly knit inspired sculpture by uh, actually Professor at Cornell, Jenny Sabin. Um, which occupies one of the atrium spaces. Um, there was an art committee on the project that that um, curated some special um, pieces in about four locations. Uh, and then the, there's there's uh, four restaurants in this building. So there's a 400 person cafeteria, um, which is themed after the US Open, uh, which is down below. There's a, a tavern, which is uh, themed after the Australian Open, Oz here. The French Open is the cafe. Um, and then Wimbledon is the rooftop restaurant. Um, and we, our firm did uh, all of the architecture, core and shell, and all the interior design, and all the furniture, and all the dusking. So really everything in this building, we, we, we did as a, in a holistic design process. Up in the tower, um, this is the auditorium, where you can see we, we, we did it with the curtain wall looking out on onto um, Ronaldo Field. Um, and kind of crowning one end of the building, we, we got to build a championship tennis court for Serena, which is called the Compton Court, kind of telling the story about her days learning tennis in, in Compton. Um, and lastly, uh, this is a view off of that uh, south facing terrace facing the wetlands. This is the outdoor space for the cafeteria uh, with our landscape architect's place. Um, uh, there is a covered bridge um, designed and built um, that is uh, kind of honors Phil Knight tells because he, he grew up in an area that had a lot of uh, covered bridges, but it's quite an innovative version. Um, so, uh, so lastly, this idea of speculation, uh, I actually wanted to show like a bunch of our current projects, but Boy, people are going to probably be sick of looking at our projects. So <laughs> I, uh, I thought, what well, could we end this on that would be interesting? And uh, so, you know, for us, like we're, we're always moving forward. Uh, we're always looking for new opportunities. We're always engaging in new things. Uh, at, we, we've moved our firm uh, three times in conjunction with real estate investments and used our firm to sort of anchor uh, uh, buildings around the city. Um, during the pandemic, we, um, we found 
a building or a series of buildings that um, were sort of our dream buildings, this, this sort of compound um, that consists of a, a Quonset hut and then a warehouse back here with a double uh, uh, radius roof and uh, some outdoor space, parking, and essentially came up with the idea that, that the, the next era of Skylab, you know, really needed a space that reflected our values and would inspire people to come back to the studio, uh, want to you know be there, whether it's clients, collaborators, friends, um, and and create kind of a, a salon or you know, a, a living room or playground for for creative uh, dialogue. And um, so this is our new headquarters. It's it, uh, we're actually moving in next month. Um, it has kind of a few components that are worth pointing out. Um, this garden is um, both has indoor outdoor kind of protected space. There's a full kitchen here where we can cook meals. Um, this is an event space that holds um, up to 350 people uh, where we can host events, whether that's music or film or lectures. Uh, we have a, the, the my favorite art gallery in town occupies the front half of this building. They'll use that for sculpture exhibitions. Um, and then the back here is a fabrication space for Skylab so we can start to um, prototype and build and integrate construction into our design process on site. Um, inside, uh, we did we designed these cross laminated timber modular conference rooms that basically set like objects into the Quonset hut. Um, the side of the building opens up and uh, you can see the kitchen as it opens up to the garden. So this real idea of being able to work outside and, and sort of do kind of the things we've been doing for clients, kind of do them for ourselves and, uh, and give ourselves access to the outdoors. And um, this is the, a view looking at the studio. Um, and lastly, uh, this is kind of a construction photograph showing the cross laminated timber uh, units in, in the open space. Uh, and that's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you. Time we have, I, think, I think two questions. Yeah. Where's Skylab located? Is it near the Pearl District or is it downtown or we're, across the street? Right now we're um, across from Whole Foods on Burnside Street, so downtown. Yeah. Okay. But moving to the north end of moving to the northwest industrial district, essentially. All right, one question. <laughs> okay. Um, so you do a lot of projects that are like quite out of the box, and I imagine you must get a lot of resistance from like um, other contractors, engineers, other teams that you're working with. So how do you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, I don't, engineers love us. <laughs> um, contractors is tricky because, you know, there's a lot of uh, what you could perceive as risk in our projects and they don't like risk and they certainly don't like to put low prices on risk. And so we we always have to work through that. We end up playing a pretty strong role in, in the procurement process on a lot of our projects. Some of them, like the, the skateboarding compound, we were the general contractor on that. It was just so out there that we decided to be the construction manager. Some of our other projects, um, if we're struggling that way, we'll bring resources and partnerships that we have at the table, like our own you know, casework people, for example, our special defabricators, and, and try to control that part of the process. Because that's usually the tricky part. It's not the getting the steel or the CLT or the scan, or, you know, it's usually more of the specialty stuff that people don't really know how to procure. So a lot of times we'll design a or we'll assist in the procurement of that. And that, that helps solve that problem. Thanks very much. Yeah.